Assembling a high quality model steam plant, part 7. Riveting the end supports and completing the condenser oil trap. Now you may be wondering why I've split this into two parts. And it's quite simple. The statistics on my YouTube channel tell me that people watch 3 minutes 50 of a normal video, on average. And a lot of my videos these days are around about 10 minutes in length. And what happens is, people don't watch them to the end, then immediately ask me a silly question that I'd already covered later on in the video. This part of the video covers the riveting process. And riveting is quite an interesting thing to do. Pardon the pun, but it's riveting, as in quite interesting. It's a way of holding two pieces of metal together without soldering or adhesive, and it's a fairly permanent process, unless you're unlucky enough to hit an iceberg in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm referring to the RMS Titanic, and that had millions of rivets in it. Luckily, I'm only going to use about 10, which makes the job considerably quicker than it would do to build a scale model of the Titanic. And the first thing to do is mark out the positions for the rivets. And if you watch this sequence carefully, you will notice that once I've marked out one of the pieces of brass angle, I use that as a template to mark out the other. I don't have to mark out both of them from scratch. Plus, the chances of errors are less that will both be marked out in an identical way. Here's an example of one of the rivets I'm going to be using. They're a bit too long, I will have to chop them down. More about that in a moment. This part of the clip shows me marking out the other part of the brass angle, and I'm just making two marks here because I need to drill two holes in order to mount the whole assembly to the baseboard. You have to think ahead sometimes. I do not want the holes for the baseboard mounting to be in line with the rivet coming the other way. Just in case the bolt that I use to mount the condenser to the baseboard fouls the rivet that sticks out just above it. So I'm putting the hole for the mounting in between two of the rivets. Now the pieces of brass angle are marked out ready for drilling, so it's over to the drilling machine to do this. I could have used a centre punch on the bench, but I do prefer to do it this way. It's a little bit more mechanical, and in my opinion, easier to get it 100% accurate. Well, maybe not 100%, but it's near enough for jazz and rock and roll. And the other good thing about doing it this way is that once I've found the centre, which I did first, all I have to do is just wind the handle and move the centre drill onto the next position, then I change the piece of brass for the other one, and the position of the holes will be exactly the same as on the previous piece. Please remember that when drilling brass angle, it's fairly important to make sure that the hole is midway between the edge of the angle and the bottom part of the angle, not the entire width of the angle itself. That way, it looks better. The holes are then in the centre of the flat part of the angle that you can see. And now, dicing with death, with this massive 1 8 of an inch diameter drill, I'm drilling the holes all the way through. And here we go, a quick health and safety warning. When drilling pieces of metal, don't hold them in your hand like this. It's extremely dangerous and you may lose fingers or you may lose even your hand. After completely deburring the pieces of brass angle on my belt sander, I'm using some Loctite 603 to stick the brass angle to the main pieces of metal that support the condenser. You may notice in these videos, I do this a lot. I just find it a very simple way of doing it. I don't have any very, very small engineering clamps that would clamp these in position and even if I did they get in the way. In any case I prefer this method because it's quicker. I just stick the parts together with Loctite 603 making sure that they're perfectly square and level with the bottom surface of the side plates and then I can pilot the holes through the main pieces of metal using the pieces of brass angle as a drilling jig. Fiendishly clever and very very simple just like a girlfriend I once had. And in exactly the same way as I did with the first side plate, I make sure that the piece of brass angle is perfectly level with the bottom of the side plate, and I'm using this square for this. The Loctite 603 doesn't grab immediately, so you get a little bit of time to move things around and get them in line. After about five minutes, the Loctite has grabbed sufficiently for me to pilot the holes. But what I'm doing in this clip is doing it wrong. I'm drilling all the way through. I'm only showing the way not to do it for the video. There are a couple of problems. The Loctite hasn't fully cured and the heat of the drill warms up the plate and the Loctite loses its grip. So on the second plate, I will not be drilling all the way through like this. All I'm going to do is just spot the holes. This is the way to do it. Then drill all the way through. And if the piece gives way, it's okay because everything's spotted to start with. 
In this clip, I'm drilling the two mounting holes in each of the brass angles. I removed the brass angles from the side plates because the Loctite hadn't fully cured anyway, it was a very simple job. These holes need to be larger so the twist drill is bigger, so I'm just making sure that the part can't spin round by using a piece of wood. And now it's riveting time. Try and contain your excitement for this bit. I have to chop the rivets because the rivets that I have are far too long. The problem is that once I chop the rivets with the side cutters, the distortion at the end of the rivet caused by the side cutters means it will not go through the hole. So I just clean them up on the one inch belt sander and that's okay. What I should do is make a jig. Push the rivets through a hole and chop them off clean with a chisel. But I've never really got round to doing that. Maybe I'll show how to do that in a future episode. And much as I hate repetition, I'm cutting five rivets with the side cutters. And after cleaning up the distorted ends on the belt sander, I'm ready to start the riveting process. This tool is called a rivet snap, and I'm currently fitting this rivet snap in my vise, and tightening the jaws securely to hold it. There are different ways of riveting. Sometimes you need two rivet snaps if you want to form a rivet head on both sides. I don't really need to do this in this application. All I need to do is carefully flatten one end of the rivet using my small riveting hammer. And this needs practice. When you first start riveting, you will find that you hit things like your thumb and bits of the angle and make a mess of it. So do practice before you do anything that you want to keep. The rivet snap that I currently have in the vise is not the normal shape. I turned it down because I wanted to use it once for forming some rivet heads on brass angle like this and the standard shape of rivet snap wouldn't fit. But anyway, for this application, I don't need to do that. It's a very ancient art is riveting. It goes back many, many years. And as you hit the rivet with the hammer, the rivet expands and holds the pieces of metal together. Riveting this way is not quite as neat as using a pair of rivet snaps, but it's slightly easier for the beginner to do. This is a safe edge file, a file that doesn't have any teeth on one side. And I'm using this to make the flattened parts of the rivets exactly the same size. Because I cut these with the side cutters freehand and cleaned them up on the belt sander, they weren't exactly the same size to start with. But to be perfectly honest, in this application I'm not concerned with the rivet heads on the inside, I'm concerned with these. Which are the rivets on the outside, and they're not damaged by holding the metal at the wrong angle on the rivet snap, and they look good. The two end supports are now completed, it's time to solder it all together. And I'm going to start off with some Friar Lux paint. This is ground up solder and flux in a small container. You will notice that I'm not applying the solder paint to the end plate, I'm applying it to the inside and the edge of the tube. There's a reason for this. If I apply the solder paste to the end plate, I can't see the line. Also, it will be quite messy and it will go everywhere. By applying the solder to the inside of the tube, once the temperature is correct, the solder melts and runs down and forms a fillet all around the inside of the tube. To clean up the outside, I'm using a paintbrush just with some water on it. But bear in mind it needs to be a proper paintbrush with bristles, not one of the modern ones with plastic bristles. And in this close-up you can see the effect of the paintbrush, you get a very smooth finish. And now it's time to solder the other end plate to the tube. But I need to make a jig for this. I need to make sure that both of these end plates are in exactly the same position. Otherwise, when I finish the condenser and put it on the baseboard, it will rock about, which is no good at all. You will also notice that I've had to move the bottom piece of steel plate out a little bit to accommodate the rivet heads on the brass plate. And once again, I'm applying the solder paint to the inside edge and the edge of the copper tube. And as I position the copper tube in place, I'm being very careful to line everything up. As I mentioned earlier, this is the whole point of the jig, to make sure that the condenser sits perfectly on the baseboard without any movement. I could have silver soldered this, but to be perfectly honest, this is not a pressure vessel. It's just a tank. It's always going to have water in it. It isn't going to get very hot. So what's the point? It's going to take a good bit longer to silver solder it. And also, if I get this wrong, all I have to do is warm it up with the blowtorch and tap it into a new position. I've already shown many instances in my videos of how to silver solder, but not too much of doing this. Here I'm feeding in some solder wire. This is standard electrical multi-core solder, the solder with the flux in the centre. 
and I'm just sort of adding a little bit. I don't really need to do this, but it's a belt and braces approach. This tank is definitely never going to leak. I made a very similar condenser a while back for my Victoria steam plant, and I used exactly the same method, except to use some different end caps. I couldn't get any of those, they were out of stock of them. In any case, I didn't want this particular condenser to be quite as fussy. I could have done an awful lot of decorative riveting on this condenser, but then it would have looked out of place because the boiler is quite plain, with not a rivet in sight. The entire condenser is sufficiently hot to melt the solder, and once again I'm using a brush and a little water to clean it all up. There is some solder around the edge of the plate, but I will clean that off on the belt sander later. While the condenser is cooling, I turn my attention to doing some polishing of the hand pump. In this clip I'm using some Brasso to finish off the polishing. Originally I polished up the hand pump on the polishing spindle, but I couldn't get into every nook and cranny. And eventually, after about a year of doing this, I'm sure the hand pump will be nice and shiny. Thankfully though, eventually the condenser was cool enough to handle, and I'm using some emery paper first, followed by Scotch-Brite, to clean it up thoroughly, and also scratch the surface, because this is going to be painted. But not yet. It's going to be a while before I paint this. It's no good painting it, and then accidentally chipping the paint. And don't get too excited, it's not going to be a painting video, because I'm going to spray this to match the boiler and the gas tank. To finish off this video, here are some different angles of the final layout of the steam plant. Personally, I think it's going to look good, this one. Ah, I almost forgot, there is some painting in this episode, but not enough to put any music to. I need to paint this block that supports the hand pump. And this is satin paint, look at it, it's really gloopy. That's only because it needs stirring and mixing up a bit. As far as I know, most paint seems to be gloss paint, and it has an agent inside the gloss paint, I don't mean like 007, it has a flatting agent, which turns it into either matte black, if there's loads of this agent in, or satin black, if there's not quite so much. If you don't stir the paint and take the paint from the top of the tin, it just comes out glossy. But if you dip your brush into the bottom of the tin without stirring it, then it comes out really horrible and patchy. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.